Can you see, I want to talk a bit about the impact on, on humanity and ordinary people, but can you see why, to many people listening to this, it is almost as if theoretical physics has become a new priesthood? Because you can make the calculations, you speak this, uh, you're translating your technical language for the benefit of all of us, and we have to take it on trust that you've got it right, and this theory, perhaps, may be the right one. Well, a priesthood is not accountable to anything but its own inner logic. We are accountable to the laws of nature. We have the WMAP satellite up in orbit right now, forcing us to rewrite a whole generation of textbooks that said that there's only one universe, that there's only atoms that make up the visible universe. That's the old thing that's been replaced by the WMAP satellite. And in six years, as I mentioned, Lisa goes up in orbit. And again, Lisa could disprove this. The laser interferometry satellite. Three satellites connected by laser beams making a triangle. The triangle is three million miles across, making it the largest satellite system ever conceived of by the human mind to be launched in 2011. And it'll detect shock waves, shock waves from the instant of the Big Bang. And if the shock waves don't come out right, if the frequency of vibrations that Lisa picks up does not correspond to our theories, our theories go out the window. And however, you have to start again. <laughs> however, if they confirm it, uh, this could be the greatest revolution in philosophy since the Copernican Revolution. In f uh, interesting, you use the word philosophy because, for example, one obvious. Uh, question which arises, which is, why should we behave well to each other? Why should individuals do good things if, if it's all purposeless, if it's not benign, if we're going to end up however we... As one uh, scientist, Richard Dawkins, put it, the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, which has a huge moral dimension to it. Why, why should we behave well? Well, look at the way Einstein looked at the question of divinity and morals and ethics. Einstein said there really are two types of God. Uh, one is the God of prayer, the God that you pray to, the God that parts the waters, the God of Isaac and Moses and Jacob, the personal God. The other God is the God of Spinoza the God of design, the God of harmony. Einstein says something very profound. He said the universe could have been chaotic. The universe could have been random. The universe could have been ugly. And yet we have this gorgeous synthesis at the origin of the universe itself, giving birth to the galaxies, the planets, DNA, life. And Einstein said that the harmony he sees could not have been an accident. That we're not talking about the design of humans. We're not talking about an intervention that gave us eyes, and noses, and ears. But where did the laws of physics come from? I work in something called string theory, which has makes the statement that we are reading the mind of God. Uh, it is based on music, little vibrating strings giving us particles that we see in nature. The laws of chemistry that we struggled with in high school would be the melodies. The melodies you can play in these vibrating strings. The universe would be a symphony of these tiny vibrating strings. And then the mind of God that Einstein wrote about at length. The mind of God would be cosmic music music resonating through this nirvana, through this 11-dimensional hyperspace. That would be the mind of God. One of the basic, I suppose, principles of, uh, of the discussion that we're having and of your book is that if mankind is doomed in this universe and mankind has to find an escape strategy, then mankind's got to be a lot better and smarter than we are now. You talk about type 1, type 2 and type 3 civilizations. What do you, what do you mean by that? We physicists look in outer space and we catalogue very advanced civilizations by type 1, 2 or 3. Type 1 would be a planetary civilization that controls the oceans, controls the volcanoes and the weather. Type 2 controls stars. They play with stars. They eat up stars for breakfast. Type 3 is galactic. They roam the galactic space lanes. Now, by contrast, what are we? <laughs> well, nowhere near even type one, are we? <laughs> We're type <Miserable> zero. Failures. <laughs> we get our energy from dead plants. However, every time I read the newspaper, I see the birth pangs of type one. What is the internet? The internet is the beginning of a planetary telephone system. I see it right before my eyes, a type one communication system opening up. The language of type one will be English. It is already the universal language of elite it will be the language of type 1. And look at the economies, NAFTA, the European Union, trading blocks. The birth of a new economy is taking place. Now, there are people who don't like this transition, who in their gut 
feel more comfortable being in a tight minus one. <laughs> They're the terrorists. They, in their gut, realize that a type one has, civilization has free-flowing ideas, challenging orthodoxies, new, vigorous, wondrous ideas popping forth. That's type one. Do, do you think that, given that, that we're not even type one or type half, that mankind is going to destroy the world in our own way before we have anything like the problems that you're talking about to face. In other words, it's global warming or we'll kill each other with war that we should be worrying about, not this. That's a definite problem. When I look in outer space and we look for signals from alien life, we see nothing. It's quiet out there. But the laws of physics tell us there should be, it should be teeming with intelligent life forms. More intelligent than we are. Right. And one theory is that, yes, there were many type zeros out there, but the savagery, the savagery of their rise from the swamp, they kept with them all the sectarian fundamentalist racial nonsense of the forest and that's why they self-destructed before they attained type 1 status so the birth of type 1 we think is going to be quite convulsive it'll take place in the next hundred years the next hundred years are the most important hundred years in all of human history because it'll determine whether or not we make that transition to to type 1 civilization a planetary civilization or, or perish by our own rather brutal means that's right and when we go into outer space and see different star systems perhaps we will see planets whose atmospheres are too hot. They did have a greenhouse effect, or their atmospheres are radioactive. They did have a nuclear war. And perhaps that's why we don't see them with our telescopes and instruments. You're, you're a communicator and a scientist, and the two words quite often don't appear in the same, <laughs> in the same sentence, which I think you often. would accept. And also, you are a scientist who talks without any embarrassment whatsoever about God. Which is also unusual, isn't it? Right. We physicists are the only scientists who can say the word God and not blush. We are dealing with the cosmic questions of existence, of meaning. Uh, Thomas Huxley, the great uh, biologist of the last century, said that the question of all questions for science and religion is to determine our true place, our true role, our true place in the universe. For both science and for religion, it is the same question. However, there has been a divorce uh, in the last half century or so between science and humanists, and I think it's very sad that we don't speak the same language anymore. But you're changing that in a way, aren't you? We are I hope. But do you, uh, just as we, as, we, as we wrap up this conversation, I wonder, you know, does this keep you awake at night? You have the same pressures as uh, the rest of us, do you find it difficult to go from pondering, touching the face of God, to come down to the mundane realities of living in a rather dangerous and sometimes nasty world? Uh, yes, there's always that schism there, but when I go home at night and I take a shower and I really think about outer space and I think about where we are going, I mean, I cannot live in an ivory tower realizing that there really are threats to our advance to, to a type 1, that there are people who actively would want us to go back a thousand years into the past. And so, yes, I realize that this is that crucial time where it could tip either way. It could lead to a paradise, an Aquarius, age of Aquarius of a type 1 civilization, or the havoc of one going back a thousand years to religious sectarian orthodoxy. Professor Michio Kaku, pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. My pleasure.